and welcome back to the Film Brain Podcast. And uh, if you've been wondering why I've been away for a little bit, I've actually not been very well. If my voice sounds a little bit scratchy during the course of this episode, I've had a really, really bad cold that just hasn't cleared up and I've just not felt up to performing at all. But that's not going to stop me from podcasting and Halloween is approaching and there's new horror movies. And on this episode, we're going to talk about three of them, almost like a certain set of Simpsons episodes, so I'm thinking we call this the, uh, Teapot of Horror. That's definitely a good idea to do when your throat is still scratchy. Mm. Anyway, I'm not suffering alone here because I've also brought on a special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, I'm Ryan Hollinger. People call me video SS, but I just call myself a knobhead on the internet who talks about horror <laughs> movies for a living. That's like the extent of it. Hey, it works, if it works. Yeah, don't fix what's not broken. Exactly, exactly. So we're, we're going to be talking about three brand new horror movies, and uh, I'm going to give you a heads up, we are going to be spoiling every single one of them, because quite frankly, they're probably not worth your time, and also there is no way of discussing these movies without literally going through them. Just trust me on this. So on this episode, we are going to be talking about Eli, Wounds, and Countdown, and we're going to be going through them in that order. So let us start off with Eli, which premiered on Netflix earlier this month. Charlie Shotwell plays the titular character who is a child with an autoimmune disorder. He lives in a plastic bubble and when he has to go outside he needs to be in a special suit. Max Martini and Kelly Riley play his parents who take him to a special facility run by Lily Taylor. She has converted this home into a clean house, specially sanitized for Eli's needs, and she is going to ostensibly treat him, which is going to lead to potentially a cure. But as the treatment progresses, Eli starts seeing visions of ghosts and other apparitions which begin to haunt him and think that maybe all is not what it seems. So, Ryan. Yeah. What did you make of Eli? <laughs> Without spoiling the twist, I should add. Uh, we should probably hold back at first. To summarize it in one word, I'd say it feels artificial. Mm. Compare it to two things, I'd say it's like Bubble Boy meets The Conjuring. Mm. You know, obviously, as you were saying there, it's a boy who discovers a rare disease, obviously goes to this um, medical house that's supposed to perform experiments on him and stuff like that. From there, it just sort of jumps between being a very bizarre ghost story and then mm. sort of trying to throw in a certain mystique that just isn't there because there's like a there's like a family drama mm -hmm. it's intersected with a family drama that just sort of has no real emotional resonance to it like i find the film to be very cold for the most part yeah there's just nothing that attached me to what was going on for me to, to really care enough as to where this would end up even though it kind of shoots itself in the foot in its marketing because i think like a few of its posters kind of just sort of give away enough of a hint as to what's happening in the end yeah the people on letterboxd the reviews that i read were especially bad at just coming out straight out with the twist which is <laughs> it's like you don't know how to word this probably do you that's the thing is like it is one of those twists that's just sort of there because it needs some sort of grand finale because I don't feel like anything that leads up to that moment really justifies it well I think it's the kind of movie that is literally defined by its twist one of the big problems with watching Eli is that you can tell it's the kind of movie where it feels like it's just in a holding pattern waiting for the twist to happen yeah like it's a very meandering film that's what I mean by compared to the con I mean, you know, when you see those sort of that sort of rise of just generic spooky jump house scare shenanigans that sort of pop up where mm. it's sort of going through the motions of having a, a ch almost a, ch a checklist of things it needs to tick off. You are right. I mean, it definitely has a conjuring vibe. I mean, especially because Lily Taylor is in this movie who was in the first oh, one. So you're right. <laughs> That's definitely not accidental. And it definitely feels like an attempt to try and capture the success of that long running franchise. I mean, say what you will about it, but even the most nondescript of the them, say something like the curse of la Llorona. yeah at least even that which i watched the other day is more competently made than this movie is yeah which is not saying a lot <laughs> it really isn't so i knew about this movie months and months ago because i'm the kind of person that watches the release schedule like a hawk just in case <laughs> something moves around yeah eli was meant to come out theatrically back in january because you'll notice that all the paramount logos are on it it's yet another dump movie it's a movie that was already in the 
dumping ground month of January. It was meant to open on the first weekend, which is exactly when Paramount released The Devil Inside, notoriously. Yeah. Even Paramount went, this isn't even on the level of Devil Inside. We're going to give this the Cloverfield Paradox treatment. Oh, yeah. Of like, just sort of, uh, we don't know how to market this, so let's just sell it to Netflix. Yes, that's exactly what happened. It's sort of a similar thing to Annihilation, except I think their justification with Annihilation was just, it was too intellectual for a mainstream audience. Yeah, that, that was the justification with Annihilation. Our audiences are too stupid to understand this <laughs> with Annihilation. Whereas yeah. the, the problem with Eli is that our audience is too smart for this movie. Oh, well. I really do get the impression that exactly what happened was that they test screened it for audiences and it just came back atrocious because the ending would have been literally the thing on everyone's minds and they realised they couldn't release this. They, they literally would have a devil inside again. That's always been my issue with Netflix films in general is because they do seem to buy a lot of properties that just have no sort of unique selling point of any sort it is like netflix very... we want your content yeah. <laughs> any content it's like they're they're sort of shallow by nature and i mean that's kind of uh, obviously a consistent trend that goes into wounds as well but mm. the only thing i really knew about eli going into it was the director kieran foy i saw the only two films he's directed which is citadel and sinister 2 mm. one of which is uh, god atrocious um which <laughs> is sinister 2 and citadel which is not actually all that bad which sort of i think watching eli you can kind of see where the director's definitely trying to get something creepy out of it and there were definitely moments in it where i was feeling like oh like some of these visuals almost have an effect on me like i think yeah. the red eyes especially on like the sort of the ghosts and there's a scene where as i said when eli gets dragged down the hallway and then it shows you it's a, there's actually ghosts in the mirror dragging him and it's like nice little effects like this that kind of at least hint that the director isn't almost entirely to blame because I think this film has three writing credits, doesn't it, as well? Which is never a good sign, in my opinion. Yeah. The direction of the movie, the, the scares are sort of competently directed, but none of the gags are really all that memorable. It's all the variations of, oh, this thing is in a mirror. Yeah. Oh, it's not behind me. Then it is. Just sort of that thing over and over. It has nothing to work with. The other thing to it, which sort of got me, is I, I kind of couldn't help but feel like, uh, so you have the family drama, then you have the ghost horror and then there are scenes where you see the boy going through stages of treatment mm. the movie then takes a sort of tonal 180 towards like this really i feel like kind of tasteless medical torture horror the depiction of medicine in the film really pissed me off <laughs> actually i i have to admit that even in the early going of this movie i was going i'm not with this I'm very not with this. Yeah. First of all, this clean house does not look like an antiseptic environment. It's literally an old mansion. It looks like they went, hey, here's a generic haunted house. Let's not give it any kind of personality or anything that would actually make it make sense with the story that we're mm -hmm. supposed to be telling. It's literally wood panels, leather chairs, various things that probably wouldn't be in this environment. The windows fog up when you breathe on them. That's probably not good in what's supposed to be a germ-free <laughs> environment. So I was going, nope, 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 nope. Uh, I don't know if clean houses are actually a thing. They might be. Uh, I did I did do a cursory search, but nothing really brought up. But suddenly they would be a lot more sterile looking than this house, especially considering that they literally go, these are the portions of the house that we've sealed off because we've not converted them. And you go, oh, yeah. this is where the dark secrets are supposed to be. Literally just glass barrier. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this, this ends up being a recurring thing across these films we'll get back to that so the only things that they've done to the house is that there's this air purification system and then when they walk in they've got this uh, depressurization chamber at the entrance of it and that's about it it doesn't even try to add any sort of richness to any at least at least expand your disbelief to some degree i mean yeah because it, it, it's funny when i was saying it reminded me of bubble boy because that, i don't know someone was talking about that the other day and then i was like oh that the the, the boy that can't go in oxygen because oxygen kills him. There's not many movies about this subject, so it's either Jake Gyllenhaal and that, or John Travolta in The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. Oh, yeah, Bubby. yeah, 1970 yeah. film. Because the way it sets up the film is like, there's definitely like a, okay, this is something you have to handle with a certain amount of care and consideration because you're dealing with like real medicine, real medical things, and then mm. when you sort of apply all the fantasy on top of it, if you cannot find a way to make that believable to some degree, you know, just by just general logic, as you were saying about like, meant to be like a germ-free environment and stuff like that, 
then it just sort of makes everything fall apart. And I'm not one to look for holes in logic, but it's very noticeable when you set yeah. up something that's so high concept and then under deliver on the return. You need to have a certain amount of suspension of disbelief. And if it's not setting that up from the outset, you're already on the bad side. And then it gets into the medical scenes and they're so badly executed. Yeah. So admittedly, I have people who have worked in the medical industry. So I, I sometimes go, that's, that's nonsense. But even in this case, I was watching... They, they screw up the basic procedure of anesthesia in this film. Like, they don't understand how that works. They strap Eli down onto the table with leather straps, bonus points, <laughs> they apply anesthetic, and then just start cutting into his leg before he finishes counting back from 100. Like, do you not understand the concept of counting back is to make sure the patient is asleep before you start doing the procedure? Oh, yeah, it... it... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it definitely like it's definitely inconsistent in terms of like, OK, here we're trying to set up all these things and then we're going to rush through this because we've only got so much to actually work with. And it's painful. It lacks any self-awareness. It is a medical thriller. Mm. I don't think it seems to be aware that that's sort of what it sits on, because, again, I feel like the entire movie rests on this one big plot reveal at the end. That, yeah. And because it rests on this one big surprise that they think in their own right is quite clever, everything that comes before it just feels like it's sort of just snippets of other horror films to kind of different styles to give you something. I didn't realise before we mentioned it just how much of this is a real kind of genre bender. Yeah. Like how many genres they managed to kind of include in here in that they just sort of touch on various different things but never really commit to any of them properly. 100%. I mean, if you give this to a filmmaker who has like at least an understanding of that, someone like Sam Raimi where you could have that sort of like self-awareness to mm. different genres and even like the elements that are far-fetched that it kind of embraces them a bit more. Mm. It tries so hard to take every little element so seriously that just everything just falls apart of the result. Yeah, it really feels very silly, especially when the ghosts start trying to carve into the walls the word lie, oh, because that's an anagram of the word Eli, isn't that clever? And then it turns out that actually, when you look at it upside down, it's a code 317, which is the code for the door lock. <laughs> yep. Uh, when I saw the whole sort of the lie on the, on the wall and stuff like that, I got sort of very per man Stephen King vibes from it. Yeah. Especially with like, it's, oh, it's trying to be all cryptic and trying to, again, give the illusion that there's a mystery when there really isn't. And there's the whole sort of tension between the parents, which as it turns out makes even less sense yeah. when we realise what's actually going on. There's a lot of kind of filler scenes where the parents are sort of arguing with the kid going, oh, you gotta, you gotta keep going with the procedure, you're not feeling very well now, but you'll feel better towards the end of it. Yeah, it'll be like, that's it's trying to justify why they're still there. It's like, that's what I mean. It's like the kid goes through these scenes of medical torture and then it just cuts back and he goes, well, do you want to go? We can go. And he's like, no, I want to get better. And it's just a very lazy way to kind of keep things going. I feel like that's what I mean. Like it, it, it's it's trying so hard to be these different subgenres and stuff like that, that, you know, why couldn't it not just commit to one and stick with it? Like if it's a, if it's a ghost story, then you could justify why they're still in the place, uh, like why they can't actually leave. It doesn't really do that till like late into the film, you know, and mm. before that, it feels like there's an exit. They have like justifiably good reasons to exit this but they don't because oh we need to keep this going and then oh sure audiences will just go along with it it's so slowly paced i really found my interest waning because nothing was really happening there's no atmosphere or anything like that and then in the background of the movie you've got this idea that it's all set in the bible belt At the beginning of the movie they're staying in this incredibly low rent motel and mm -hmm. eli gets harassed by these hillbillies in their rv who ridiculously just go, hoo hoo, that's a boy in an astronaut suit, hoo hoo, let's throw beer bottles at him. For kicks, I guess. Yeah, there's like weird southern gothic territory just for like a tiny snippet of it. Again, it's why. And the big billboard sign of, you know, the religious God saves signage as well as they pull out there. Again, it's only there to justify the twist later in the film and we might as well just get round to it because otherwise there's not really much else to talk about. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. It's a feature-length film that should just be a short film. It's a feature-length film where nothing really happens until about 10 minutes from the end of it. <laughs> yeah. 
How do we keep you distracted for an hour? So the twist, as it turns out, is that actually it's not really a clean house and it's not really a treatment facility for the people inside of it because Eli discovers that all the patients before him have all died and there's also a big creepy cellar where, as it turns out, it's actually a former nun's convent. All the supposed surgeons are actually nuns. He and the other patients that were killed, who were the ghosts, were actually half-sons and daughters of the devil. Because that's a thing that happened in this movie. (laughs) So Eli discovers that his mother had some sort of Faustian deal with the devil, there's this Rosemary's baby thing, and then they try and get him in for the final procedure that might well kill him, and then because Eli has discovered his true parentage, it's like he's flipped the evil switch, he turns bad, flips the surgeons into upside down crucifix positions, and sets them on fire. Oh, and bursts his dad's face like a zit. I like that bit. I mean, I I get the impression the only reason they didn't release this into cinemas is because they couldn't edit this down into a PG-13. Oh yeah, like, when it shows you all the sort of the the medical scenes, that goes into that sort of R-rated territory, and then it kind of tones it down to a pretty shallow ghost story. When you get to that last ten minutes, when it full goes into the whole satanic part of the film, it gets much more graphic and stuff, and I'm like, that sort of feels like that's where it wanted to be from the start, but just couldn't. While, again, I think the twist feels tacked on to give us some sort of emotional payoff or nothing else happening in the film. I feel at least those 10 minutes, I thought there was something a bit more palpable about it, I guess. I was yeah. kind of like, yeah, you know, I thought this would be cool if it was more alluded to throughout the film. It reminded me of that film, The Last Exorcist, where, mm. again, very different film, but it's basically about a guy who's just a performer. He uses exorcisms as a way just to generate money, and then he goes to this old Southern Gothic house out in the middle of nowhere, finds this girl, thinks that she's just mentally ill. It sort of just alludes that there is actually something sentimental going on and then that way I don't know obviously spoil that film just because there are people out there haven't seen it but it does a really good job at kind of making it feel like hey is it really satanic or is this all just in his head or you know and yeah. I, the film doesn't play on any sense of questioning or any sort of suspense at all like you're, you're not really thinking all that much throughout the film you're not really provoked by anything that they've shown you it just sort of has to lay this oh he's a child of Satan and once we're at that point I don't feel like I'm surprised more so than it's like oh we finally have something that's happening but yeah. there's nothing that drives towards it to give it that sort of payoff. It literally comes out of absolutely nowhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and then there's like this, there's a girl that Eli meets outside the house who pops up and she's talking to him throughout the film and like they just become friends. But again, it's sort of vapid, shallow conversation, doesn't really go anywhere. She's played by Sadie Sink and of uh, Stranger Things. Oh, yeah, okay. And then at the end, it reveals that she's also a child of Satan as well. And it's like, okay, so she's... She was just there to add another twist on top of a twist. She contacts him all throughout the movie. Every so often he creeps out into the hidden area that he's not supposed to and she appears there. And we're meant to think that she's someone that lives fairly close to the <laughs> facility, but we're not really buying that even from the start. I got a sense that she was going to be something supernatural because there's a moment where he turns away from the window and then she's suddenly there Yeah, in an impossible way. Yeah. She knows way too much about what's going on. She keeps saying things like, oh Eli, you're the strongest and all that. But really the big problem with this twist is that it's completely movie breaking. It's the kind of twist that seems like something that was added by someone completely retroactively, which is probably not actually what happened, but it feels that way because it feels so internally contradictory to everything that has been established before. People complain about Cinema Sins videos and things like that, saying, oh, plot holes aren't a thing. Now I don't like Cinema Sins videos, but I will yeah. tell you, I've watched enough bad films to tell you that plot holes are indeed a thing and if you don't believe that watch this movie which is literally a prime example of them i would define a plot hole as something that violates the internal constructions of a story and boy does eli have those kind of things in spades the biggest one is that they explain the reactions that he has is because his parents have been spritzing him with holy water even though we have literally seen on several occasions including the first five minutes of the movie when his suit gets split that 
if he reacts to an environment, they weren't spraying him with water. He was literally reacting to the open air. Yeah, and it's sort of like his, his allergic reactions are supposed to be to do with, oh, this is you just, you know, teething your pars, basically. It makes no sense whatsoever and treats the audience like idiots, like we didn't see the movie we've just been watching. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I mean, I, I was like, I would I would have believed it more if it turned out he was a vampire, because I thought, oh, daylight the, the outside. I, I don't know. I just at I, least that would have made sense. It would have at least justified it a bit more because there's something kind of very cold about the entire film. I mean, like stylistically cold, like the, it's quite blue and it's so chilly the way everything's set up. And then I guess that's supposed to contrast with the whole idea that oh well, actually the Satan and that's you know we we contrast that with hell. But again, there's no real symbolism before that to justify it. Again, there's also things like they keep complaining about how expensive it is, how much money. <laughs> Yeah, the, so the reason that he was staying at the motel is because they need they need to save as much money as possible for the treatment, which makes no sense. It's a fabricated environment. Yeah. They don't need money. The whole thing is a pretext for murdering children. And the whole way through it, it just it's it's quite blatantly obvious throughout it that you're like, okay, the mother's gonna side with the son, and the dad's gonna turn out to be a massive bell end who's gonna be like, oh no, we have to kill the boy because he's the devil. And he's very overly aggressive even before yeah. the point where he's supposed yeah, to be. It's funny because all I know about that the actor that played him is that he. He kind of does a lot of military bravado sort of style roles and that kind of that makes sense he is just sort of there to be the the aggressive overarching breadwinner dad he's very caricature almost but i mean mm. he doesn't really show much emotional depth beyond just sort of being yeah angry dad 101 there's other things like okay there's three different procedures that we have to do and then you go why are they doing that if they have him anesthetized can't they just kill him while he's anesthetized in the first procedure <laughs> done we're not trying to cure you we're trying to kill you yeah and in the finale of the movie, they try to stab him with the big ceremonial dagger that comes out from a crucifix. That's the point where he strikes back against them and you go, well, well, you, you had two opportunities to do this previously. I don't understand this <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> There's also the fact that internally, we've spent so much of the movie with Eli as a sympathetic character. I don't want to bag on the child performer because I think he actually does fairly well here. Yeah. Child performers, they do what they're directed. And in this case, it literally is a different different performance from when the reveal happens. <laughs> when you see him kind of embrace being that sort of demon child, I actually thought like, hey, he actually pulls off the creepy kid vibe quite well because yeah. I find when kids being evil children in films just quite frustrating and quite annoying. And in fact, when I mentioned The Conjuring, I remember Conjuring 2 has like the red-eyed child ghost in it as well, which this film has. And it just feels like blatant copy and paste. Mm. At the end of it, I was like, oh, okay. So it's going for like a almost an origin story to the omen, but with all these far fetched nonsensical plot line. I mean, it's it, it's the kind of crap that back in the early 2000s, if you asked Hollywood to do a prequel to a classical film, this is the kind of crap that they would come up with. It's so dumb and I don't even understand how the twist is supposed to work because what happened to the husband during all this? They never really explain how that actually happened. Oh, I prayed for God for a son and the devil answered. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why did that happen? You can't just say that and then just accept yeah, it. there's nothing to emotionally or symbolically link them to the devil. It just sort of be like, oh, I, I made a deal with the devil. It could be, you know, you've seen those sort of deal with the devil style narratives where you said there's usually a motive behind why they're connected to the devil, like they've done something wrong or something like that there. But again, there's no complexity behind any of the characters other than they, they serve mm. these sort of one note purposes of being, oh, the mother that loves her child, the dad who's overly aggressive, and then the child who finds out he's actually an evil son of a bitch the entire time. I felt genuinely sorry for the performers because they are way better actors than this oh, yeah. and they are trying so so hard Lily Taylor in particular seems to be trying really hard to give any kind of credibility to her character and I think that Kelly Riley is a very underrated performer uh, Kelly Riley probably not hugely well known but you might have seen her as the lead in Eden Lake yes another fairly underrated horror movie I've actually seen her perform on stage I went to see uh, Othello on stage quite a few years ago now when I was back in school and it was a performance that had her as Desdemona acting alongside Ewan McGregor as Iago and Chiwetel Ejiofor as Othello. Oh, wow. And, you know, that was a really great performance. She's good in this movie. She's just 
given terrible material. But, you know, I, I think the one thing that I'll give her even more credit for is that she doesn't give up on it very... I mean, she clearly... No. You always see that in a film where an actor just... They don't. They clearly don't want to be there, so they, they give up entirely on really giving any sort of emotion to it. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that a bit oh, later. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, yeah, no, she definitely, she definitely brings some sort of heart to it. I mean, what lack their heart there is. I mean, the final scene in particular is really kind of rage-inducing. So the, the house is burning down because, of course, it catches on fire then the girl is waiting out the front for him and they establish that she oh is one of them by having her eyes flash red which is <laughs> yeah. super goofy doesn't she say something along the lines of oh i couldn't help you because the devil wants you to prove your worth or something yeah, like it, that, and that you go, it's another cop fight what <laughs> Eli literally says to her, it's like, why couldn't you just tell me? It's like, oh, because then you wouldn't be able to find your true potential. Or, yes, yeah, along those lines. And, like, you've just kind of exposed your own writing flaws in there by, you know, yeah. trying to clean up why she was there, but why she couldn't be any more impactful on the story. And then it ends on this weirdly jokey note of, oh, mum, you're driving. Yeah, let's go. Let's go meet Satan. I'm going to take you to your dad. It ends like it's going to be the prequel to Little Nicky. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, the way it ended, I was kind of like, I'd be more keen to see what happens next as opposed to what just happened there. Exactly, it's like the half a movie, and the first half of it makes no sense anyway. Yeah, like, I, I, swear, I swear to God, like, if in those sort of Satan child movie, I would have thought that what we just saw there was the prologue to what should be the feature film, which is them going off to find Satan or whatnot, because it's such a thin idea stretched over nearly a hundred minutes. It really tries to get blood from a stone. It's rare that you find yourself watching watching a movie going, I'd like to watch the movie where Adam Sandler talks like yes, the entire time. <laughs> That's what Eli is. Yeah. Speaking of Netflix, we should probably move on to the next title, Wounds. This one is about a haunted phone. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. Set your expectations to groan already. Army Hammer plays Will, who is a bartender, and one night a bar fight breaks out while a bunch of college students are in there. The students leave their phone behind, and when Will unlocks it, he starts getting mysterious messages saying that they might have summoned some sort of demon of some kind, as well as some disturbing pictures, and then after that point his life begins to unravel and he starts having huge amounts of hallucinations that is basically the rest of this movie yeah i mean what you just <laughs> said there is more information than even the movie gives you yeah it's not a very well made movie and again this is the second dump movie because this was originally produced by anna perna who are quite beleaguered at the moment but i have a hard time believing that even they would have released this in cinemas because this does not look like something that would have survived very long in that environment at all no this ended up getting sold to hulu in the us so uh, no one saw it <laughs> and uh netflix internationally this did actually play at film festivals it played at sundance and it played at can oh wow imagine that uh reportedly i heard it was laughed off the screen at those festivals which is especially bad because the director was in attendance oh lovely. I, I feel genuinely sorry. The director, incidentally, is uh, Babak Anvari, who previously did Under the Shadow, which is a very well-respected movie, but this, this is way off the rails. This is based on a novella by Nathan Ballingrud called The Visible Filth, and presumably that makes more sense than what has actually appeared on screen, which is absolutely incoherent at points. What's weird is, I feel I have more to say about this this, despite how far little actually happens, I think, in a way. Yeah. It's like a day in the life psychological horror. It sort of just meanders around Army Hammer's character, Will, the bartender. He starts getting, they start creepy stuff start happening. But again, it's it's like what I was saying about Eli. There's like, a, there's usually at least an applied mystique to it where he's investigating, he's going somewhere with it. It's leading towards an end game. Mm. But no, this is the same kind of film where nothing happens and then it dumps a conclusion on us. Yes, it's exactly the same problem 
in that regard. I will say, it, out of the three movies, this is probably the one that actually, ironically, has the most potential. Yeah. Because while I dismissively say, oh, it's a movie about a haunted phone, and I have every right to be dismissive about it, <laughs> there is more attempted with this film. There is at least a try on the filmmaker's part to make a movie that is commenting on deeper psychological issues yes. and trying to touch upon themes of masculinity and toxicity and also of internalized emptiness. That's the main theme of the whole movie is this idea that Will, as a person, he lives his life kind of sliding through it, coasting mostly along on his charm, but he drinks and has sex and tries to find some way of making up for the fact that emotionally he's completely disconnected and really he's kind of an awful person because army hammer in this is a real asshole <laughs> he is a oh, yeah. major asshole <laughs> yeah in fact actually when i finished watching it because i kind of wanted to know what other people thought of it because I, I i like i had my own interpretation of it because it's funny you were saying like things like toxic masculinity and stuff were in it i thought it was like an allegory for alcoholism but i don't mm. think it really dwells on him being an alcoholic more than so than it's just him you know oh he drinks when he is at work and then he said asks people like for a drink at 10 a.m in the morning but it doesn't really go anywhere else with that yeah it's it's sort of like an implied tribute but it's never really conscious enough to make that a thing yeah it, you spend the entire time with his character but i don't feel you ever learn anything truly about him no that's the weird thing is that we don't really know very much about his character other than well he just seems to be a kind of unpleasant person to be around he's got all these things like i said alcoholism he's got issues with his relationship you know he's, he, you sort of learn about him just being obviously it establishes him as a, a charming bartender and you're like at first i actually kind of liked him and then you start to learn oh no he's actually the biggest piece of shit in the world yeah. well, but, well actually i say that he's not the biggest piece of shit in the world he's the he's the second behind the bar regular that turns out to have a confederate flag in his, oh in yeah, his yeah. Place. I was like, the turn like my friend actually came in as I was, wa I was watching it, and he was like, "Is that a Confederate flag?" And I was like, "It is a Confederate flag." I feel like that's the same kind of logic that Will has in that scene. He realizes, "Oh, I, I don't really know this person at all," and it turns out he's actually really terrible. I think that's literally what the point of that is meant to be. Yeah, it turns out that person was Rossen, but also he's Rossen as well. Yeah, but like he's so unremarkably rotten, as in he's just another dud bad person in the world and mm. trying to wrap an entire story around him it just isn't compelling enough no you know i understand things like alcoholism and stuff like that people can relate to those issues and i do think that there are definitely things in the film that are trying to speak for certain people but i don't feel it gives him enough personality to make you feel like he's more than just almost a manifestation of problems i kind of got the sense the movie was in trouble because the first 10 minutes of the movie are them in the bar and nothing about it feels very real. I was going to say that it's so unnatural. Mm. The way the film plays out and the way it ends and everything like that, I kind of thought maybe it's deliberate. Maybe it's supposed to feel like his entire bubble is falling apart and everything mm. turns out to be phony and superficial and all there, but it doesn't really give any sort of visual cue that that is the case. No. It just sort of seems like the director said, you sit here, you sit here, you do this, you do that. We need to film this and move on to the next thing. It feels kind of rushed that there's nothing organic about the way the characters interact. Even the way they kind of move around the scene and stuff like that it's it's so repetitive and i, I guess mm. again that repetition plays into his life being what it is it does feel so staged well it's also because the first 10 minutes of the movie feels like okay we have all these characters in the bar let's literally set everything up oh, yeah. in the first several minutes of the movie so they hit on everything so they establish az beats character is a regular in the bar we've got confederate guy who ends up getting stabbed in the face at the end of that bar fight they got the college student who roll in there and the first sign that Will is an awful person is that he goes oh college students yeah sure I'll serve them I have no problem serving them I don't care if I'm bartending for someone else I am fully fine with just selling alcohol to underage people and getting that license revoked that's fine yeah. apparently that's a regular thing because when he when he visits the police later in the movie in an otherwise completely pointless scene they briefly mention oh well we're cool with you Will that's why we don't respond to reports of underage drinking so apparently he does that on the regular <laughs> even the, the fact that the bar is filled with cockroaches and i'm like surely this place would have been shut down by now the cockroach literally crawls on one of the bottles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not even subtle yeah and that's why it got me thinking like when you were saying about it not feeling real it was like oh well, maybe the cockroach
cockroaches are all in his head, but it's like, no, yeah. everyone, no, people acknowledge them, they're real, they're there. Yeah, yeah they're real, and Zazie Beat says something, oh, that it might be her or a boyfriend, says so something along the lines of, well, if you see one, that means that there's hundreds of them, they're all in the wood, and it kind of gives you this idea of this internal rot, you know, sort of the festering nature of everything, which yeah. is meant to be the central metaphor, because this movie is really unsubtle about pointing that out half the time. I did kind of like the motif of rotting. Yeah. That's what I mean is I think the film tries, but I think it's questionable whether it's trying too hard or it thinks it's way cleverer than it actually is. I described it to you sort of uh, as being like watching an Ari Aster movie like yeah. Midsummer or Hereditary if it fell completely flat on its face. Yeah, when you told me that, you told me that before I watched it, and then when I was watching it, I immediately picked up on what you were saying about the Ari Aster stuff, because we were saying earlier about when his life sort of starts to, to fall apart. I think just for context, like, so the students leave the phone behind in the bar. He then thinks, okay, I'm going to give it to the police and, you know, they give it back to them and stuff like that. Then the people on the phone end up saying that they've committed some sort of ritual or something like that. Or yeah. he, he finds dead body photos on the phone. and There's a severed head and that becomes a weird running thing where they f do flash frames. Of oh yeah, a lot of that. Dakota Johnson as his girlfriend with a severed head and then later Zazie Beats, but that doesn't really connect with anything. It just sort of feels like they threw those in there because it is a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> There's like bizarre little visual like shadows or like mm. ghosts or something that just randomly pop up and then they're gone. There was actually a point where I think he goes into the house and then there's like a, a very faded black shadow that just sort of moves past behind him. And there's parts like that where I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. I think it adds some sort of illusion to tension, but yeah. because it's only there for pure flair and not to sort of build towards this overriding mystery, it doesn't have any lasting effect. No, exactly. And it kind of falls into this weird thing. So the central metaphor is to be kind of flexible to a certain extent yeah but it also feels the need to explain it constantly <laughs> Like, it's it's too, it's too so vague that they have to specify it down. But that's the thing. It's like, that's where it comes goes back to, you know, is the film intentionally shallow at times? Mm. I said this a few times in all my videos. I would hate it when a film tries to pretend it's self-aware by acknowledging mm. things that are clear issues because I always see something as sort of the illusion of depth is when, like, it, you know, it throws something out there, but there's no emotional connection to it whatsoever. It's like, you know, he's an alcoholic or he's psychologically disturbed or, or you know, toxic masculinity. But it just feels like, again, the whole movie is set in his bubble mm. that there's no sense of a real world it feels very filmic it doesn't feel like an actual organic living breathing world army hammer's character runs around does a bunch of stuff so there's actually a scene where you just see him getting a sandwich and he sits and eats a sandwich and uh why why do we need to see this he's literally in every single scene of this movie yeah we see the entire movie from his perspective but god damn he does sort of try army hammer's so trying here again i just sort of felt sorry for him especially in the moment where he has to take his shirt off and start flailing in the street because yeah. he starts hallucinating. This is a weird comparison, but he reminded me of Steve Carell in Beautiful Boy. No, I, <laughs> Beautiful Boy I actually really liked, but Beautiful Boy was also that sort of day in the life sort of, it's a bit meandering, it kind of doesn't have a very clear cut structure and stuff like that. No, for, it has good reason to be like that and mm. it does it with a bit more focus. The reason I'm comparing Army Hammer to Steve Carell is that they're trying to elevate the material so much and give so much life to something that need, requires more nuance. Mm. It's almost like there's times where they chew the scenery and then there's other times where they're just so pulled back that they feel like they're completely detached from everything that's going on and then yeah. it pulls you out of it too because I still feel like you can watch a movie about bad characters and sort of still feel somewhat invested that's if the film has a way of sort of neutralizing things and making you feel like you're part of this journey whether it be their self-destruction or whether it be them figuring things out whatever it is but I don't feel like the film ever makes you feel like you're attached to him in, in any capacity it feels like you're an outsider watching him Yeah. again not bad it kind of works that sort of uh, voyeuristic to you could say but mm. there's nothing outside of the phone that really alludes that there's any sort of big grand conspiracy or reason for it to feel as voyeuristic as it is the whole central focus of the ritual on the phone is really in the background for the majority of the movie but the problem i i found with it you can clearly tell that the approach that they were trying to take here is something cronenbergian i didn't actually see it myself so i'm actually curious to see what you have to say on that well i think it's most obvious again in that scene in the car where he's talking on the phone and then he starts hallucinating the 
phone is a giant cockroach. Yes, okay, yeah. Yeah, that sort of pulsating visual, which actually made me laugh. It didn't throw it, that made me laugh, to be honest. It really genuinely did. There was a couple of moments in this that I laughed. The whole thing with cockroaches and the kind of psychological aspect of it, you could kind of see how that kind of shapes the action a little bit. But you do get the sense through the movie that maybe it isn't actually happening, maybe it's all psychological, and then the movie completely ruins that because it's very obviously happening also to Dakota Johnson. Yeah, which again, doesn't make any sense how she's suddenly involved. None whatsoever. So I think she accesses the phone at one point and then after that she starts investigating it or something like that. Yeah, she, she Googles a book. Yeah. And then suddenly she starts seeing images of a tunnel on her laptop screen and ends up in a trance by them because, again, flexible metaphor, wide open spaces, emptiness. Yeah. This makes no sense on an internal level because if this is meant to be sort of, oh, maybe it's real, maybe it's not, it's clearly real because it's happening to someone else. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like I'd be somewhat more into the sort of obscurity of it if the phone itself was more ambiguous. I mean, the fact that it's this really bright yellow modern phone dropped by a college student. Yeah, with heart stickers on the back of it. Yeah, yeah, it just it takes short of the idea that this is something obscure and cryptic and creepy, and if that looks quite almost cliche to be that way, I think I would at least buy it more than this being just a modern piece of technology, because if the film is trying to imply anything about technology being evil, it does not do anything at all with that idea. It really genuinely doesn't. (laughs) While we're on the subject of Dakota Johnson, she's not very good in this. Oh, she's horrible. I mean, I don't really rate her all that much in general. I haven't seen her in many things, though, to be fair, so I'm probably not the best uh, I mean, uh, she gets a lot of stick for Fifty Shades of Grey, but she's probably one of the best parts of that movie. Oh, I've never seen it, so I can't say. She handles that role with a sort of knowing wink. Ah, right. That kind of elevates it a little bit, but in this, I think it's very obvious that Johnson saw the writing on the wall here. Yeah. She looks really depressed. She looks like she's checked out of this movie, and not in a, oh, this is a relationship that's falling apart sort of way. This is a, I can't be bothered with this movie any more than I have to be. <laughs> it's the most convincing thing in the entire film that she does not care to be there <laughs> you can read it all over her. it's not it's not even subtle again when it tries to like escalate the tension between them like where obviously he's got a thing for a girl that comes to the bar with her boyfriend that army hammer's character will has for her played by zazy beat who does really very little in this as well yeah but like with dakota johnson it's like there, there's again there's a point in it where they are clearly supposed to have a real standoff proper argument that's supposed to really at least i feel it's supposed to really sell the tension between them but whereas army hammer is sort of escalating in anger and frustration and again it's sort of breaking the shell of exposing how much of a rotten character he really is she just remains very cold and very muted and monotone and very unexpressive i cannot stress just how jarring it was to that entire film that i was like wow i've never seen someone so miserable to be on set in a film before it's really quite striking especially because you mentioned how jarring it was you end up alternating between scenes where she's playing a character in a trance where she's clearly giving a performance there yeah and then in the scenes where she's acting off army hammer she just kind of reverts back to normal even after (laughs) seriously spooky things have happened to her there was at least several moments in this movie that made me laugh and one of them so the second time she gets possessed she's to such an extent that she is urinated herself on the chair and he tries to give her a bath and then when he puts her in the bath she starts oozing black fluid out into the bath until it completely submerges it and she falls into the water and then re-emerges with no memory whatsoever of what's just occurred and then a few scenes later it's the following morning it's, they're just having breakfast and army hammer just goes this isn't working i'm thinking about breaking up with you and at that moment i just started laughing yeah it's so casual she's just been possessed and then he goes i, I think we need to break up with you just like they just had an argument the night before oh well pff, why not yeah <laughs> it's, just made it ridiculous. Even when going back to the, this was all kickstarted because he, he read some messages on a phone, he loses that phone? That's the scene where he, where it turns into a cockroach and he throws it out the car and then yeah. it's just gone. Well, there's a car that follows him and then that person gets out, takes the phone and then leaves. So he's being watched, but that doesn't pay off to anything because then once the person that follows him gets the phone, they're out of the film. No, it doesn't leave Until the conclusion where he gets the phone back very, very briefly just so that they can get that tiny climax out of the way. I just want to briefly go back to Zazie Beats because yeah. again, her character, she's so wasted in this film because at least Mullen Johnson she's trying yeah her character's likable you actually feel something for her she's probably the only likable character in the movie 
it's kind of weird because obviously she's in Joker as well. Mm-hmm. Her role in this is very similar to her role in Joker in that she just appears to be a periphery character just for the main character to bounce off of, essentially, without giving away certain details about Joker. She's totally an object to the film. Yeah. And I understand, like, I guess it kind of makes sense. Well, it makes sense, but again, the context of both films, again, you're still underutilizing the actress because Will's character in this, because he obviously has a thing for her and that's sort of the reason breaking up with Dakota Johnson's character is because he wants to be with her even though she's got her own boyfriend. There's a point in it where he even tries to like make out with her and she's like rejecting him and stuff. And it's it, it's so uncomfortable. It really genuinely is. And she deserves better roles than these. She really genuinely does. Can you explain the ending for us just for a few moments? Okay, this is where I'm gonna ruin this, uh, if I can be ruined anymore. As we were saying at the start, there's a, a fight that breaks out in the bar. One of the patrons gets stabbed in the face, which happens to be the guy with the Confederate flag. He lives above the bar. There's one point in the film where Will comes to visit him and sees that the guy refuses to go to hospital. He's got this massive gash wound in his uh, cheek, clearly infected, and as we were saying about the motif of it, it's, it's starting to rot. When he gets fired from his job, or well, quits his job from the bar in like the last five minutes of the film, he he walks up into the patron's apartment. The phone is there. He picks up the phone and the ritual seems to be that they're trying to bring a demon or some sort of creature into the present world. And so Will starts to notice that the gash wound is actually a portal to another dimension or some sort. As cockroaches start to infest the house, he basically puts his mouth to it and seems to imply that it concludes with him being possessed by some creature. That's how I can describe it, if that makes any sense. I feel like it's very abstract to a certain degree, but yes, un- unclear. So my feelings on the ending was that I was sort of glad that it was on Netflix <laughs> because it meant I could rewind and watch the ending about six times. One, because I wasn't quite sure what had happened in it. And two, I couldn't actually believe that it happened the first time. <laughs> yeah, like when it happens where he just puts his mouth over the, the wound and then it just sort of cuts to black, I was kind of like, wait, what? What? Oh, it's I supposed to I again I, I use the word jarring a lot but I don't think I've ever been left so shell-shocked by an ending where I'm just left going did, did I miss something I feel like by that point in the film I was so disconnected from it that when it happened I felt like I had been pulled into a different experience altogether it's very strange it's totally disconnected from the rest of the film again going back to the hereditary comparison would be like if the climax of hereditary was about 10 seconds long <laughs> that's what I mean like like I was saying when I was describing the ending there it's like he he goes to work one day, he's drunk, and then he abruptly quits his job, and then it just gets straight to this really quick climax without any build-up. It just sort of feels like he just stumbles upon it more than it feels like there's any drive towards this. Yeah, it doesn't feel like there's something pulling him towards it or anything like that. Kind of like Eli, I feel like it ends just as it's starting to get kind of interesting, where I'm like, oh, there's something could happen here. There's something, I feel like I feel like there's something that should happen next. I don't feel like it helps that the last shot of the film is so badly staged. Part of the reason I had to rewind it so much is because there's CGI cockroaches filling the fucking frame and I couldn't see a bloody thing. Oh yeah, like the fourth wall breaking bullshit? Ah uh, yeah, it was really annoying. It's like, oh, did you did you see what you're supposed to be seeing? No, can can I just actually see it happen, please? Because I think I think it sort of seemed to be like so the, the tunnel that Dakota Johnson's character was seeing on the computer was supposed to be uh, like a portal to another dimension or something like that that's, yeah, the ga- and that's in the gash wound and I'm like but I don't see the symbolic connection between these two characters like why why is it because I know there's a, a forgotten plot point in the film where Army Hammer gets like a rash under his armpit oh yeah and then it turns into like this gaping sort of armpit vagina yeah yeah it's, and I was like okay <laughs> from my interpretation of the film it was supposed to be like the ritual was to let some sort of demon or some spirit or some sort of creature into the world or to possess him so he was sort of picked to be possessed I think that's what it was getting at yeah that's 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 what's meant to be happening there. So I was reading on Reddit and someone on Reddit made the most compelling interpretation I think you could possibly give the film that at least gives it some sort of logic, which is like the creature was trying to create a portal out of him, but because he's sort of like toxic and he's like alcoholic and so detached from everything, it couldn't use him as a host. So it had to use someone that was weaker than him. And I was kind of like, okay, that sounds like there's something you could be fleshed out of that, but that's not what the film gives us. I did do a little bit of cursory reading of the source material. Yeah. And I think the vague sense of what's supposed to be happening in that conclusion is that he realizes that, yes, I am emotionally bankrupt and vacant. Yes. But 
that I want I want to feel something because he sort of rambles that in the ending. Yeah. I think in the book it's much more clear that he's actually intending to surrender, that he wants to be filled by the possession of the demon that he summons out in the very last shot. But in the film, they don't really make a very good job of explaining that or conveying that in any real way. So yeah. when it happens, you just go, what? And then it ends. <laughs> There's no build up. It just seems like he's like, yeah, fuck it. Why not? Let's let's do this. Uh, you know, because I know the, the last thing that Dakota Johnson's character says to him is about, yeah, you're like a hollow person and stuff like that. And I was like, ah, very on the nose about that. And then, as I said, then he gets to that and it's like, oh yeah, you're basically surrendering yourself to a demon. It, again, it's a neat idea. It's just very, very badly executed in the process. Just the general execution here is so flat, just completely flat. You see, I've watched a lot of J-horror and mm. that was my biggest gripe with the entire film was just how it is very blatantly snippets of very popular J-horrors. If you were to describe it as one thing, it's actually got a lot of the ring meets one missed call in it mm. where it's like I said, so you have obviously the, the portal on the screen could not look any more like the videotape from the ring and it plays up this whole idea. Yeah, very obviously. And the way ring plays out is again, it's kind of like almost a real time seven day thing where it's trying to play out like we're building towards something obviously Ring actually has an escalation in terror and tension and danger and an actual story to tell. This film's just one big flat, motionless nothing. And then with One Missed Call, again, it's like, okay yeah, the, the phone being evil and being like a curse. It never seems to have, have its own voice. You know, I like that it's trying to be kind of, again, artsy and stuff, but the film just falls into being pretentious mm. because I don't think it even knows really what it wants to be itself. You talking about The Ring and One Missed Call, that brings up an interesting point I was going to ask, and maybe answers it, is that can technology be scary in this movie's case no but i think it genuinely does come down to the execution it's difficult in like modern age to make technology scary. i mean i know i mean like we obviously talk about things like drones and uh i mean obviously the new terminator tried to pull up modern technology as being an issue like ai taking control of itself and drones being a thing and mm. how we have no privacy and all anymore and how like we're always under surveillance but the thing is i think we're kind of partially desensitized because we know it's so commonplace that it's hard to have that effect on us it's different when when something like when Terminator first came out where the idea of like robots in the future was a kind of a genuine fear especially when technology was more of a new thing and not it wasn't so commonplace as it is today yeah obviously you'll, you'll talk about it when we go into the countdown film mm. you had the, the unfriended the Facebook horror film and it's like and friend request <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah yeah there was, there was quite a few of them and uh, funny enough those two films I think came out after another film called Open Screen or Open Open Windows with Open Windows that was the Elijah Wood one yeah they can almost have a kind of unique quality to them but I don't think they have any effect on us anymore because it's such commonplace stuff I don't think anyone's managed to make technology truly scary in the last 5, 10 plus years it's the hard thing to pull off because it's so ubiquitous the way that I feel is that if you're doing a horror movie about technology don't make it supernatural no supernatural elements Elements to technology these days is dopey. It just comes across as really goofy. Because the conclusion of Wounds is like a lot of a how Pulse works, which is another J-horror in mm. Pulse. It's like ghosts that travel through technology, basically. Because I feel that most of the fears that people have about technology these days are more rooted in things like identity theft, or being hacked, or any number of things like that. Very real concerns that people have, and you could probably make a good horror movie out of those. Those feel like more credible threats than a supernatural one. It kind of goes back to that thing where we were going from like the 70s into the, you know, before the slash era in the 80s and stuff like that. The 70s managed to be such a prolific part of horror because they played almost exclusively on social fears. So things like Stranger Danger and stuff like that. I talk about it prevalently in my videos because I do think it kind of shows you where I think the heart of the problem with a lot of modern horror is. Now, I think horror has been great for the last 15 odd years. I do think we see a lot of unique things being made. You know, obviously this year we had things like Midsummer and even Jordan Peele's Us and stuff where like, again, they're sort of dealing with genuine intimate social issues and stuff they're not trying to force it on you I feel like they're doing it with a level of sincerity that is sort of missing from like a lot of Hollywood ones where you know like Unfriended where it's like oh let's play on the whole popularity of Facebook and make that scary or even Unfriended 2 which was like the, the dark web but if we're talking about like social fears you said exactly that things like identity theft and stuff like that is the genuine fear it's the idea that we take our privacy for granted we sort of forget how vulnerable we are as people Um, there's actually a documentary it's basically yeah it's like, it's like a, a guy that takes people's 
identity and moves into their house and stuff like that there and it, it interviews him the imposter i think it's the imposter yeah it's the imposter i mean and that's that's a documentary but that's way more effective than what a lot of modern horror films do and it's like if we're not doing supernatural stuff or very very evidently scary things then it just seems to be in the eyes of people it's not a horror there's actually a warning outside of screenings for the lighthouse over in america where it's basically saying this film is supposed to be in four by three aspect ratio it's supposed to be in black and white they actually had warnings telling people these films have to look like that mm. and i think that sort of speaks for the kind of generation that we have there's such a disconnect between those that just want the sort of cheap thrill of a horror film the sort of escapism of it if you will and then you want those that want something that is genuinely more raw and more personal it's hard to make those things work i guess but this is a good way of transitioning to our third and final film because that is definitely more of the cheap thrill variety and continues <laughs> our technological theme our third and final film which is the one that ryan hasn't seen ryan very thankfully has not seen in fact is countdown which is the only theatrically released one out of these and if you're in america the only horror film you'll be access to in october which is very very unfortunate <laughs> wow we are continuing with evil phones but this time it's an app as the tagline for the movie literally goes i kid you not death there's an app for that Ah. <sighs> Okay, so here's a synopsis. So there is an app called Countdown, and the reason is, is because it's an app that literally counts down to your death, and people are downloading it, and one of these people is Quinn Harris, played by Elizabeth Lale, and she discovers, to her horror, that she's only got a couple of days left. And, to make things worse, Countdown starts coming true, and when it doesn't, it's seems to be taking its own attempts at making sure they die on time. Quinn has to find a way of somehow managing to get rid of the app, which doesn't delete, or find a way of breaking what appears to be some sort of curse. This is directed by a guy named Justin Deck, and this is his feature film debut. You probably won't recognize him by name, but you might recall him because he does have some YouTube success. He's a short filmmaker, but he also does um, advertising spots as well. Countdown is actually based on a short film that he did in 2016. It's a five minute short, and it's literally just sort of the premise of the movie. If here's this couple, she's downloaded an app, and it says that she's going to die in three minutes and then he gets possessed and kills her that's it that's not really much for a short film but apparently someone thought it was to make a 90 minute variation of it are, are you familiar with countdown anyway have you seen the trailer well my friend actually he works like most social media and marketing for our local cinema chain and he said he sent me the trailer so he did when i saw it i kind of thought to myself this looks absolutely atrocious it looks so bad but it seems like it's so aware that it's bad that i wouldn't be surprised if it came out and it actually does have one or two redeeming things to it it's, it's a bit like you know when unfriended like the title was terrible the idea was like just very schlocky and teen killer kind of thing then anyway, i whereas i thought unfriended had some tiny bits of merit to it when i saw this trailer i was kind of like oh it's just going to be like one of those movies where it just seems like it's going to be another possessiony demon monster ghost thing you know buy the numbers tick all the boxes uh make your halloween money and then disappears forever that's pretty much on the money <laughs> you, you you got this movie's number i hate mean, phone jokes it, phone it's, jokes it seems like this movie's like 10 years late yeah because isn't like that whole countdown app thing but wasn't that like like website things like uh fear.com and stuff like that those movies it probably was yeah it yeah. doesn't seem like it's the most original concept in the first place <laughs> So I did watch uh, some of the guy's short films. He did actually have some viral level of success. So a couple of years ago, you might have seen a short film called Boats, which got a huge amount of popularity because it was basically around the same time as Planes and Cars 2 and is an entire pitch meeting of a group of executives talking about a movie called Boats. And it's all this incredibly cynical Hollywood satire of, oh, Hollywood just likes to make things for money there's one executive that goes i remember the days when we used to make things for heart and we go and i go wow really i was watching it earlier thinking the only reason this was popular is because people were bagging on those movies at the time because otherwise this short is six minutes of exaggerating out the same joke is incredibly smarmy and has terrible acting in it <laughs> wonderful 
and it turns out that short explains why Countdown is the way that it is. Yeah. You mentioned it might have a comedic sort of tone to it. I can verify for you it does, but in a kind of weirdly backhanded kind of way. Okay. So not like Happy Death Day? No, it's not like Happy Death Day, unfortunately. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious that someone made something about the cynicism of Hollywood and then makes a movie like this. <laughs> hey, I'll make a bland horror movie, but if I put in jokes... That means it's tongue-in-cheek, right? Yeah. The illusion of self-awareness, as I always say. Yes. It's the kind of movie where they're aware that it has a really goofy premise, so they kind of throw in a few nods for it, but they play most of it straight enough that it doesn't feel like it's self-aware. Yeah. And the funny bits occasionally made me chuckle, but they don't fit with the rest of the movie at all. Yeah. So the movie, basically, to boil it down to its core components, it's like Final Destiny nation meets the ring again which sounds like it could be a good idea on paper if it wasn't pg-13 <laughs> oh, <for fuck's> sake. <laughs> yeah. yeah so the movie very much obviously sets out how much it's ripped off from final destination yeah. in its pre-title sequence where we have a character who downloads the app onto her phone and she's only got minutes left she's at a party and everyone's drinking, and they all decide to get the app at the same time. They're spouting all this terrible dialogue. I think someone says, oh, stop complaining like a B-arch or something like that. <laughs> it, it was kind of that level of dialogue. Okay, right. See what you're in for. Her boyfriend gets drunk at the party, Evan. Evan tries to drive her home drunk, and she decides not to do that. And then she gets a message on the app saying that she's violated the terms of service. <laughs> this is a thing. This is a thing. So what happens in the opening is that she goes home, somehow beating him in the car, and when she's in the bathroom, she's suddenly hoisted in the air by an invisible force that slams her onto the bath and kills her. And then we cut back to Evan, who has crashed his car in the passenger seat where she would have sat. The tree has impaled through it. That's how she violated the terms of service, because she took action that avoided her death, even though it probably wasn't entirely connected to the app. <laughs> <laughs> what? Ah. The demonic app has a terms of service. This is a key plot point, as it turns out. This is just an iTunes terms of service cautionary tale. It's an entire joke about the fact that no one reads terms of service. Oh, fair enough. Okay. It's also meant to sort of conceal why the app's attacking them at first, but it just okay. makes it really <laughs> unclear what's actually happening. Yeah. If the app determines that you're using it to avoid the circumstances leading up to your death, that apparently constitutes a term of sub service breach then it sends the spirit after you <laughs> does it justify like because uh, like, i mean it's like oh you broke our terms of service that's kind of a contradiction in its own logic like it's telling you when you're gonna die yeah exactly is it literally just expecting you to just go along with your life like oh there you go there you go there, yeah. that's it that's it <laughs> So, for example, one of the characters, there's another character called Matt, and he joins with Quinn during the course of the movie because he's also somehow violated his terms of service, and it later transpires he was meant to be on a train that was going to crash, but because he made a conscious decision not to visit his relatives, that meant that he broke the rules, so now he's being targeted? Yeah, so, hold on, if they committed to the journey, they'd still die anyway, so it's either you're dead if you do and you're dead if you don't. Yeah. Okay, that's weird. Also, given that they predicted this train event before it happens, they make no attempt at trying to stop it whatsoever, which is an interesting <laughs> thing. You're going to die on a train crash in about a day's time? We could save like a whole bunch of people. No, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah. no, they never bring up that idea whatsoever. Oh, brilliant. So, yeah, there's no trolley dilemma at all in this. <laughs> no, nothing whatsoever. They don't even go into that sort of thing. In fact, we only get it briefly reprised later in the movie after that character dies, they go into a hospital and then they see the news of the train crash. You know, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, oh wow. You definitely know it's a teenage PG-13 movie when the characters do not give a shit about anyone but themselves. Well, you know, they gotta, they gotta let it happen. Bruce Willis has discovered that he's gonna be unbreakable. <laughs> <laughs> If that was the plot twist, I mean, there might have been something to it. Turns out it's in the split universe. <laughs> Jesus, don't give him ideas. It's hard to know where to begin with this, because it's such a sprawling mess. <laughs> Sir Evan? 
Eleven ends up in the hospital because of the accident. So him and the main character, Quinn, she knows him because she works at the hospital. She's just finishing up being an intern. She's just passed the exam at the beginning of the movie. They're having a party. There's a really stupid bit where they're cutting the cake and they literally do a smash cut to someone stabbing the cake as a jump scare. (laughs) You remember that bit in Silent Hill Revelations where the Pop-Tarts come out and they play it as a jump scare? Well, funny you mention uh, Silent Hill Revelations. Uh, The actual cinematographer for this film actually shot that one as well. (laughs) What a coinkydink. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe he came up with that same idea. And I get it. (laughs) That's meant to be a winky kind of playful nod. No, it's just dumb. Don't do that. (laughs) It's not funny. It's just dumb. Evan likes to hang out where there's a special sealed off area that they haven't properly renovated yet. Okay. Again, linking this back to Eli, literally just this taped off area, and it looks like a, like one of those haunted house hospital corridors. Things oh, are wow. rotting, and what? This is in a hospital? <laughs> Why does it look this way? Why does it look so terrible? And this is in the first 10 minutes of the movie. Oh, we're only 10 minutes into this? <laughs> yeah, this is 10 minutes in, and this stupid shit is happening. Like, it hasn't even properly kicked off yet. When he pops his clogs, that's when she discovers that the app is real because he tries to run from his surgery by hiding out in a stairwell and then his dead girlfriend appears to him and attacks him and throws him down the stairs. Okay. All three of these movies are s- sort of have recurring elements to them because she ends up getting his phone which somehow miraculously ended up back in his room even though it was there at the bottom of the stairs when he cracked his skull on it. Oh, oh uh... <laughs> But she needs to unlock the phone, like Army Hammond needs to do in Wounds. So she goes down to the morgue and tries to use his corpse to activate the the security detection. Jesus. She has to open his eyes to get the face detection to unlock the phone. (laughs) <laughs> you see, no, like, again, in the right hands, you could absolutely make this quite a good comedy. That's because it sounds like a good setup to a, like a really gallows humor punchline. But as you're describing it, it seems like it does take itself quite seriously. And this is supposed to be like a genuinely harrowing moment. It's sort of darkly comic when you describe it. Yeah. But not in the way that it's shot on screen. Absolutely. You know, you can see this being a joke in a Sam Raimi movie. Yeah. But not in this film. The punchline is that when she drops the phone at the end of it, she looks back up and the head has turned towards her. Of course. <laughs> okay. It's not even an effective punchline. It keeps doing the standard stop jump scare of here's something unexpectedly there when it wasn't supposed to be over and over again. Is it one of those cases where if she's not the only one with this app but she's still the one that gets all the possession people following her and all that stuff, all the spooky stuff happens to her? Well, she's not the only one. It happens to everyone apparently that has broken the terms of service on the app. So there's a sequence where she looks up the app on YouTube and sees a video of someone who's posting oh I've been haunted by demons and then there's a video of her getting killed uh, which I guess she was live streaming that Let, let's, let's just say that she was live streaming her own death let's be okay. generous there <laughs> even though that's stupid but then there's a whole bunch of comments saying bullshit I don't believe this is real and and then she'd close the laptop and then the ghost of Evans there for a jump scare it's that kind of movie wow that's the same jump scare at the end of Unfriended. So the main character is called Quinn, and I did spend a good chunk of this movie going, did they just name her Quinn to make a Dr. Quinn medical woman reference? Is that a thing that they did for some reason? Because Quinn's an unusual name. Yeah, it's not the most conventional for a film like this. Yeah, you'd think it'd be something a bit more just generic. Uh, her sister, uh, played by Talitha Bateman, she also downloads the app as well. The app attacks you partially by using ghosts of dead relatives that's a thing that it does because that's a thing that's been seen in a bajillion horror movies yeah their mother died years ago because Quinn was at a party or something like that her mother went out looking for her and she got killed by a drunk driver Matt uh, has his own trauma because his brother died and he took his brother's favourite toy this animatronic dinosaur okay and so he gets haunted by visions of his brother including a scene where the demon creeps up on him in a toilet (laughs) okay surprisingly uh, the demon does not get piss all over its shoes (laughs) Uh, and then it manifests as his brother and starts walking through the cubicles Ooh, scary. The scares in this movie are quite pathetic, actually. It's it's really impressive. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's it, it's doing the mechanical stuff but it's not even doing it all that well i mentioned the two films that i compared it to previously but it also reminded me a lot of blumhouse's truth or dare it's like that but worse wow the other thing about having a Final Destination premise, though, is that you probably shouldn't have three main characters. You probably should have more than that, because otherwise you, you don't really have anywhere to go. That's the thing, like, Final Destination is built off of one idea, and that is crazy over-the-top kills. I mean, the first one's a bit more, oh, I mean, nuanced is not really the best word for it, but you think, if anything, it'd be the kind of film that's totally perfect for a kill count? Yes, exactly. That's what you're paying for? It feels like what you should be paying for? Ideally, you need six, seven characters if you're going to do some kind of scenario like this, because Final Destination kind of got it down to a science. Uh, I remember that Joel Silver used to say that, oh, an action film needs a set piece every 15 pages, and Final Destination has a kill roughly every 15 pages. Ages. Yeah. You need something like that to keep the momentum up. What happens in Countdown is that because for most of the movie, aside from the two opening kills, we only have these three main characters, that means you, you know that they're not going to kill any of them off for a significant period of time. Oh wow, so it's really trying to commit to telling a story? Yeah, we see it with those really trashy teen slashers and killer movies. You feel like it's like, okay, they're so trashy if they just embraced being what they were and committed to like at least a creative kill kind, you would get something a little bit more engaging out of it, but it, you know, it only have three characters and and commit to trying to explain yourself when they're really the more you explain it the less tangible it feels the middle act of this movie is painfully dull nothing happens yeah i'm sure because there really isn't enough plot to sustain itself for even the 90 minutes that this movie has god the weird thing is that quinn and matt start having a relationship right i'm assuming it's not that organic at all it just sort of happens well it's definitely not organic because these characters only know each other for a day and change <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so this is ridiculous, but suddenly the characters are now, oh, I, I really love you. Then when Matt dies, she goes, I'll be with you very soon. You go, what? But you barely knew him! Yeah, that's a bit of a commitment. <laughs> He's just a guy that you literally met yesterday that said he was going to die, so you probably shouldn't have got too attached in the first place. That's the thing, if, if you're not going to go down the route of being kill kind extravaganza, you know, at least develop what characters you have. I mean, it's only three. There's only three of them. I mean, it can't be that much work. And obviously the death scenes aren't that memorable because you got the bath, you got the stairwell, and you got Matt's death, which is, again, another Final Destination riff because he gets hit by a truck just like oh. the bus scare except we've seen that played out a bajillion times before so when he's standing in the middle of the screen going oh i survived i survived smack wow so it's just very anticlimactic like i literally called it <laughs> about two seconds before it actually happened it's the kind of stunt that's so obvious you see when you said it was based off of a youtube short you know that's obviously pause for concern because it has happened in the past where we've seen filmmakers be picked up from youtube and have gone on to make films so uh, um, we had uh, Fede Alvarez from We Made Like the Evil Dead and Don't Breathe. And then there was that film about three years ago, uh, Lights Out, which was based on like a, a like a two to five minute short film. Oh yeah, David F. Sandberg, who went on to make Shazam recently. The premise of this is, is a pure mm. gimmick. It is definitely the, I know this might sound alienating to the medium we're on, but it is like the generic YouTube mainstream audience kind of effect. It feels like what like that film Smiley was or all that crap that the YouTube Red makes. It just feels like that's what the target demographic that's going for. It is pre-teens yeah. to teens, you know, and people that just sort of want cheap chalk thrills. But even then, as you said, there's only so many of them and it's not it's not enough to sustain itself. I mean, I saw this in an environment where it's supposed to be. I saw this in a uni town. There was quite a lot of teens in the audience. I think some of them were kind of tense watching it and I just go, why? It makes me wonder though how sincere that is because when a big, like a mainstream and horror film comes out that I ever went to see in cinema the audience yeah you would have a lot of teens and stuff in the crowd but it feels like they would force the idea that it's scary or even if it's genuine or not it just feels like they're kind of conditioning themselves to be affected by it it felt like that like I could hear a couple of people kind of whimpering but no one ever screamed or anything yeah. like that it's not the film that's doing it it's them that's doing it so it has no yeah effect, really. exactly there's a weird amount of comic relief in this movie yeah I can understand 
not taking this entirely seriously because you shouldn't, but the two major supporting characters in this movie are just flat out comedy characters. We have two characters here. We have Father John, a priest played by PJ Byrne, who is probably best known for his role in The Wolf of Wall Street. He is someone that is obsessed with demonology and just kind of got into being a priest because he really likes that sort of thing and he kind of gets excited about it. Yeah, it seems like the kind of character he'd play. I could kind of get behind that idea. Again, it's the execution of we first meet this character and he's high on weed and he's eating communion wafers and wondering where his just eat is at. Like, oh, that's the tome. That's not a funny joke. It's just awful. He's the priest character who explains the plot, but the difference is he's a nerd. <laughs> so we're sort of self-aware with it. And he explains that it has some relation to an ancient curse involving a warrior who asked for his time of death and then he realized he was going to die in his next battle. So he sent his brother, but his brother survived and became a hero and, and the curse got the warrior. And then I guess that became an app? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> Like, it doesn't really explain where the app came from or why it's linked to this thing that he's talking about specifically, even though it clearly is. Yeah. Just like how the characters go, well, why are certain people affected by this? And the movie never answers that question. <laughs> does it ever, like, try to explain the demon thing in it or anything like that? Like, like does it have, a, like, an actual... That that, that was you the backstory one... I just explained. It. That was it. What? Okay, right. I... <sighs> Okay, this is painful. Uh, uh, yeah, all right, all right, all right. I'm... The the other comic relief character is a guy named Derek who has a phone shop, and he is played by stand-up comedian Tom Segura. Oh, yeah. If you're not familiar with Tom Segura, he is the kind of stand-up comedian who has specials where he talks about political correctness and how absolutely ostracized he is as a comedian that he can't use certain words. His last special apparently was very controversial because he kept insisting, I can use the R word PC culture blur oh. and thus I have a special on yeah. Netflix like oh man you're being so oppressed yeah it's that kind of irony where they call out people for being easily offended they themselves are easily offended by people who are offended so it's uh, it's kind of a vicious cycle he's that guy as it turned out oh, okay. which made me like Great. it made me slightly embarrassed about the fact that I did laugh at some of the stuff that his character did in this movie because he does have a few funny lines in it because he's just basically being a massive dickhead yeah. he just goes through the movie being sarcastic it's just an app that counts down but it clearly worked on you you two clowns. They hire him to hack into the app. So let's talk about this app in a little bit of detail because it is nonsense. Oh yeah. Like I would expect that a movie that knows about technology enough to base its premise in it would actually make it in some way plausible. I mean the, the most plausible thing about this app is that when they look it up on the app store it has a 3.6 rating. If you look at an app on an app store and it has that kind of rating you immediately look at the reviews and think that's a bit of a red flag anyway. They don't look at the reviews instead yeah, I would love to see those. Uh, one star got cursed by a demon. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, but yeah, that goes back to, like, you're sitting here writing better jokes for a film that could have been a comedy. Exactly, exactly. It could have been a satire. Too late now. Yeah, too late. So he hacks into the app and gives them more years. And when he goes into the app, he realizes that, first of all, this is a 60 gigabyte app. What the fuck? Yeah, it's 60 gigabytes. He goes, that's unusual. That's a whole season of Game of Thrones. Like, no shit, Sherlock. I don't even think my phone has 60 gigs of yeah. data on it to store an app that huge i think people would have noticed yeah i mean my my phone's 64 gigs so that's probably sad enough this is an absolutely enormous app that cannot be deleted you try <laughs> to delete it it cannot it refuses it gives you an error message <laughs> so if you didn't want this app it's stuck there now i guess and it constantly shrieks at you all oh, right so every time it does a notification it goes ah! like a screamer what so it, yeah, it's got its own little oh wow that's... can you imagine this this enormous app you cannot get rid of keep going nyeh, nyeh. oh yeah you just smash your own phone <laughs> oh no but if you buy another phone it self installs on your new phone that happens to quinn she breaks her old phone she gets a new one from derek yeah and it instantly reinstalls uh wow the whole um, shrieking thing is taken from the short film because in the short film it keeps playing Purple People Eater which isn't scary incidentally and yet they play it constantly in that five minute short I'm getting flashbacks of uh, the snowman with the wee popcorn song that they play it'd be like if God. in the snowman they just kept constantly playing popcorn <laughs> 
<laughs> half the supposed scares in this movie are literally just the phone giving them a notification going, I've updated. Ah! Wow. But the reason that it's 60 gig, as it turns out, is that Evil also does not care about privacy concerns. <laughs> Because when he hacks into the app, it's got the data of literally everyone who is using it. Oh, wow. Okay. And sell you, so you can access it. It profits. It sells ads. And in real time, you can see every single person that has downloaded the app counting down. That's how they manage to change it, is they enter in their names and he just simply changes the hours on it, which of course resets. Like, holy crap. <laughs> Boy, really should have read the terms of service on that one. Uh, just not protecting the data at all. Huge data breach right there. The film doesn't end up being a bit like Rings, where like it goes viral in the end and everybody's using it, or something by default. It doesn't even have that level of imagination. Oh, fuck it. Like, at least that would introduce more characters into the fold. But no, it's literally, this is a very, very cheap movie with about five main characters in it. Yeah. Six. Six main characters. We'll get to the other main characters character in a minute. Back with Father John the Priest, he realises towards the end of the movie, he knows what they're up against, and he thinks he can find a way of breaking the curse. And the way of breaking it is that they have to prove that the curse is a liar. They have to prove it wrong in some way that the countdown is not accurate. They can do this via a number of ways. They have to either kill themselves, try and outlive it in some way, or kill someone else. That's their three options. Okay. Okay. So again, that sort of elements that you've seen in a lot of other horror movies that kind of reminds me of Drag Me to Hell in that kind of way, and that you got the ticking clock. Yeah, yeah. And you could potentially curse someone else. That's the direction that the movie heads in later. The movie weirdly seems to climax early. It got to about an hour in, and it seemed like it was wrapping up. They draw a pentagram on the basement of the church in paint and salt that the paint is mixed in just in case the demon tries to blow it away. Yeah. So they, they all get inside the the pentagram and it works it works the demon tries to attack them and it can't get in the circle it touches against the circle and it starts to burn up a little bit okay so all they have to do is stay inside the circle for at least a minute or two matt who's the one that has the least time ticking away he's in there and suddenly his phone starts deafening the other characters just playing the tone so the other characters are going, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, and he can't hear it whatsoever. And then he starts seeing a vision of his brother, and it's the toy dinosaur robot. It comes up to the circle, and then he does an idiot move where he just walks over and goes, I'll get that for you. And he steps out of the circle and then gets slid out. How? Oh, uh... Yeah, I know, right? Oh, wow, that's... And then all the other characters just run out of the circle after him, and then they never do this again. The movie just forgets about it. Yeah, so what happens is he gets dragged out of the circle, the ghost drags him outside, which is where he ends up getting hit by the truck. Yeah. But literally, this happens because they were too stupid to stand in a circle for two minutes. I don't care if the demon is trying to deafen you. The entire objective of what we were doing here was that you stay in the circle, and it's been proven effective. And yet, they instantly forget about it. As soon as he's dead, the priest doesn't go, oh, come back down into the basement, we'll just stand in the circle for the next few hours. Oh, when he gets dragged off, some shells fall on Jordan, the, the younger sister, and she gets injured, and so they need to take her to the hospital. Just draw another one at the hospital. Like, the movie literally climaxes, then realises, oh, we need another 20 minutes, and then just forgets. <laughs> Oh no. Ah, so it's a miracle it turned out the way that it did. Like, because the way you were describing it there, I was like, yeah, that's that's definitely the. Oh, wait, no, there's more to go. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, it's the typical ending to these kind of movies. Oh, it ends in this kind of exorcism procedure. No, no, that's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. It gets worse. I haven't even mentioned a major portion of the movie. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Brace yourselves. <sighs> So this movie decided, in its infinite wisdom, it was going to tackle me too. What? Yes. Strap myself in for this one. <laughs> Peter Fascinelli plays Dr. Sullivan, who is Quinn's boss. Okay. He's a, you know, like a established doctor at the hospital. He leads her out into a room and he tries to force himself upon her. Okay. She pushes him away, manages to fend him off. I was going at this point, this is a really weird thing to include. And then later on in the movie, about halfway through, they realize that they need to find a way of making sure that she's not at work. Work. Mm -hmm. Suddenly she's called into a tribunal where he claims that she assaulted him. 
What? And they believe it? Oh, yikes. She doesn't even get a chance to say her side of the story. They just believe him just entirely based on him telling it. And then they're immediately going to put her on suspension. Jesus. Y really? Wow. Th wow. Yeah. This is not the most plausible thing in the world. And I'm watching this scene going, what does this have to do with anything? And why is this here? Why is it in this movie? How is this appropriate? Like, I don't have a problem with you taking on this kind of subject, but it needs to be the right kind of movie. Yeah. And it needs to treat it with a certain amount of sensitivity, neither of which this film has. Yeah, it seems like a tear choice for a film to have it about a killer app that's put me too in it it seems well i mean i'm assuming the film was a rush job in its own right it just seems like something maybe they forced in to try and pander to the idea that it's kind of modern and yeah it really does seem like they just sort of saw it in a news headline and went oh that's in the movie now. Yeah. Why? I mean, I know that there's sort of the audience that is going to cheer for something bad to happen to that guy, but is it really necessary to be in this movie? Is it? Yeah. This subplot kind of goes in and out of the movie, and it's out of the film long enough for me to forget that it was even there, and then the climax happened, oh. and it suddenly becomes a key element. And he realised the reason they put it there is so that we don't feel in any way sympathetic towards him. So Jordan and Quinn are going to die within minutes of each other. Okay. But Jordan is going to die first, so she needs to find a way of saving her little sister. So he ends up being the doctor that's treating Jordan in the hospital for her injury, which feels like that wouldn't happen because there would be an obvious conflict of interest there. And then one of the other nurses approaches her and says, oh, I've experienced the same thing. If you want to take this guy down, I've got your back. And then suddenly she goes, I've got a bit of a eureka moment. Why don't I try and kill this guy? <laughs> because <laughs> he previously downloaded the app earlier in the movie and went oh i've got 50 years or whatever it was so she goes oh maybe i can break the curse by killing him instead oh okay. so you remember the old abandoned section of the hospital yeah she leads him out into there under the pretext that she's going to seduce him this requires him to be very very stupid yeah but he goes out there nonetheless she puts her plan to motion by beating him with a crowbar <laughs> so she starts viciously trying to incapacitate him and then and she's got enough morphine to overdose him. Yeah? Wow. So she is fully committed to murder. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very jarring left field swift there. She's meant to be a character that we're meant to find sympathetic, but no, she's full tilt murder. Bloody hell. Even though he is a piece of shit, questionable morality to say the least. <laughs> when she tries to inject him, suddenly the demon yanks him away. Okay. The demon is protecting him. She tries to run towards him and then the demon throws her backwards and injures her. There is something sort of funny about this in the way the, the doctor knows nothing about what's going on so he's just watching himself being flung and her being flung around going what is even going on there's like freaky shit going on here what? which doesn't help the credibility of what's going on yeah so he manages to escape actually so he doesn't get killed I was thinking as the climax of the movie played out is something actually going to happen to that character because otherwise you're just letting him off the hook which would be weird yes in the very last scene in the movie they go oh it was really great that all those nurses testified against him and there's a photoshop picture of him in a mug shot in a news oh, article right. <laughs> jesus and you go wait hang on a minute does that mean there's no consequences for quinn beating him with a crowbar that he would very obviously have evidence of be it on cctv and the fact that he would have huge great bruises and, in and injuries from it <laughs> like you literally discredited yourself <laughs> <laughs> which i feel like is a bad that's a bad way of handling that whole thing just so yes. awful just sort of an offhand way oh by the way he went to prison you don't even give the satisfaction to the audience of seeing him die horribly yeah he kind of just strips it away from you doesn't it the actual ending is that so there's seconds ticking away now and so what happens as the demon is about to attack jordan suddenly quinn manages to rush out with the overdose and she injects herself with it and and she dies and that causes the demon to burst into dust because apparently no one's ever done this before yeah you'd think that someone else would have tried it no one's ever attempted something like this and succeeded in it that's what i mean yeah the way you described it is like that seems like an easy defeat and it is it's a very easy defeat 
And then they don't even follow through on that because, of course, she's a trained medical person. Her sister turns her over and she's marked in lipstick where she has to inject her with the vial of something to counteract the overdose. What? Which she was carrying in her hand the entire time. She just drops it as she dies. Oh my god. So she's dead, but then she gets brought back. I don't think that's how that works, but... Uh... I mean, good thing they're in a hospital just in case. Just in case. Yeah, just And good thing too, they were in a hostel in the first place, so they had a ready supply of drugs just for this whole scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all very convenient. So the final scene is the two sisters and their father, who has not been seen throughout the entirety of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> is this his first... Yeah. They go visit her grave, and then suddenly, as they're walking away... She looks on her phone. It's a notification that says Countdown 2.0 has been installed. And that's when it smash cuts the title. But yeah, because when she died and she was revived, I was like, well, so she didn't technically die. So the demon technically isn't destroyed. Oh, God, fucking... Why even try and question it? <laughs> the movie did weak ass sequel bait in the final moments. It did the final jump scare and it did one of the limpest I think I have ever seen in any movie. But then it's not even over then. Oh, it goes on? Oh yeah, it continues. It has a mid credit scene. Of course it does. Halfway through the credits, Derek the hacker pops it back again because he mentioned that he had a date. So we see the date and it's a joke about, oh, his profile picture is nothing like him. Ha <laughs> ha How very amusing. Of course. And then the demon strikes back at him for hacking by killing him. And that's the mid credit scene. I get the, the impression this was just moved as a comedy coda for from something that actually happened halfway through the film. Yeah. Because he mentioned that the date was something that he was going to on the day that he was hacking, but this is several days later, so... Eh. It just seemed like I tried to get like an extra cheap thrill out of that, so I did, but... It's like, how, how does the demon exist? I thought it was defeated. Why did it come back as a second app? I do uh, This movie's dumb and it's bad. <laughs> 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 and that was Countdown. It was terrible. Do you want to see it? Uh, no, well, I mean, I think you've, you've saved see, see my time and patience for seeing it, but so thank you for doing your service. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to ask a question. Do you think an app can be scary? I think the idea itself is, as I said earlier, is quite gimmicky in its own right. So I feel like you could go down the route of, I'll give you an example. So there's that film, Fear.com, years and years ago. Now, it's a goofy premise in its own right, but it does have a sort of an element of believability and like the idea of a website where people go on it and they get killed. I know that there's a different film, Untraceable, I think it's the sort of snuff film version of it. Mm. Yeah, you could say the idea of an app, not necessarily a killer app, but an app that has a negative connotation of some sort or a negative reaction. You could definitely get something like a thriller out of that or going back to J-horror like when Asian horror in general tends to do high concepts like this they find a way to make it believable like a killer videotape sounds gimmicky but it's convincing. Yeah, and there's a sort of sense that you would stumble across something like that. You know, it kind of harkens back to the idea of, oh, maybe you might be watching a snuff tape or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you could say, like, okay, what if the app shows you a premonition of how you die or something? You know, get like, I guess kind of like the Final Destination things, but they don't know when it's going to happen, but then they start to see the environment around them reflect that premonition. So, like, you could definitely be more inventive with it, but in terms of, like, making it genuinely creepy, I think it'd be a very hard thing to pull off. I think if you went down a sort of social fear route where you play it more like a thriller the idea of being stalked or the idea of being followed you know yeah. it could definitely be feasible I think the only issue is with an app being installed it pulls in a lot of real world plot holes and contradictions and stuff yeah. like that that make it a lot more challenging I guess but the idea of something like a virus installing itself on your phone whether it be something that's able to follow you or whatnot could definitely be doable I was just thinking a second ago I was thinking the idea that you only have one set locked time is a real limitation yeah because there's not really much you can do with the premise if you don't have that many characters or anything like that so why not instead of the terms of service joke just have it so that certain actions actually means that the time changes you mean like they get more time by doing specific things yeah which i guess kind of makes it like that really rubbish justin timberlake movie in time oh yeah where they get like yeah that was a whole economy thing oh yeah that's right time as commerce get the metaphor yeah that kind of is also something that this movie lifts from but you know at least 
that would kind of give them more to do and kind of gives a little bit of maybe actions have consequences in certain ways. Yeah, it reminds me of, there was actually uh, a Dave Franco film, I think, from a couple of years back, where they had to do a series of tasks. Oh, no. There's another film similar to that called 13 Sins, which is like, okay, the guy's looking to get money and the more tasks he does, they get progressively more unethical as they go along. That film and specifically played more on like desperation of poverty and having to do what you can to survive and stuff and humiliating yourself in the process. So if you get those social elements in it that people relate to, I think that kind of connects them more to the horror because I don't think horror should ever go for just straight out being just scary. I think it needs to have a real world connection for it to make any sense. Yeah, it needs a grounding. Yeah, yeah. Even the most supernatural premises out there, they have something tangible to them to keep you connected to it. You know, that's why I think separates, you know, good horror from bad horror. I think good horror understands that it's not about being scary. It's about sort of reflecting real fears, real anxieties, real mm. doubts as opposed to just being like, oh, I'm going to throw something at the screen and it's going to spook you. Just on a final note, I was going to ask where you would rank these movies. I mean, obviously you've seen two of them and I've seen three, so I, I would rank, oh, it's real close between Eli and Countdown. I'm going to put Eli at the bottom because at least Countdown, it moves fast enough. You know, it wasn't totally terrible to watch, whereas Eli felt a bit like a chore because of its slow pacing. Yeah. And then I would put Wounds just a out at the top of this sorry lot because at least it tries to do something slightly more than the others. I'm on the same boat in a way. Uh, I, I would say like, again, I've, I've pulled up Sam Raimi quite a lot in this podcast, but like, it's kind of like something Sam Raimi once said, the worst thing you can do is make a boring picture. And mm -hmm. I think Eli definitely is the definition of a boring film. Whereas we described, I mean, I haven't seen Countdown, but like, I guess if I'm watching it, I'm like, I could see the sort of schlocky, silly premise of it that it's like, hey, I, you know, as you said, moves fast enough that I'm like, okay, I'm sure it's more just its services, its job, and, you know, it's, it's just a forgettable film, and that's really it. Um, whereas I said, with Wounds, I mean, I'm probably being too generous, but I don't think it was necessarily terrible. I walked out of it with enough of, like, a, a, an impact that I was, like, thinking about it, because I was like, well, what was that all about? What did I just watch? And, I mean, they may not necessarily all been for good reasons, but I'm not to sound like a snob, but I feel like the more you think about that film, I feel like you're applying your own substance to it, and yeah. it kind of gives it a certain... There's a bit more gravitas to it, you could say. It feels like the kind of movie where you could actually make a video about it. <laughs> you know? That's why I feel like I had more to say about it because I feel like if I was desperately was making a video on it, which I don't wouldn't because I'm not really emotionally connected to it, I feel like, yeah, I could totally get things out of this, mm. but I would wonder how much of it am I really, really grasping at straws just to try and squeeze out of it. Yeah, how much are you projecting onto it? Yeah, because I feel like I would need to see what the filmmaker wanted to get out of it because I feel like once they've applied their logic to it, it kind of helps contextualize it a bit. Because mm. I mean, as I said, I, I, haven't, I actually haven't seen his other films film. I mean, it got critical acclaim and it seemed to be quite beloved and stuff like that. Yeah. It makes me wonder, was this just a misguided or a, just a try too hard and you know, flew too close to the sun kind of thing? Yeah, I think I think that is precisely what happened with Wounds. So, where can people find you, Ryan? Uh, you can find me on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Ryan Hollinger. You can also find me on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash Ryan Hollinger. Thankfully, there's not many Hollingers in this world, so <laughs> usually most things with Ryan Hollinger, that would likely be me. And yeah, I'm also on Instagram but horror hollinger and yeah that's that's about it um. <laughs> uh you can find me on youtube on my channel film brain uh you can find this podcast on all the places that you can find podcasts so itunes stitcher all those great places be sure to like and subscribe on those as well you can find me on twitter at fb underscore bmb on tumblr at film brain bmb facebook at film brain reviews and if you have any feedback about the episode be sure to comment on it let me know what your thoughts were on any of these movies if you've seen them but until next time i'm matthew buck fading out and hope you all have a safe and happy halloween take care everyone thank you for listening to the film brain podcast hope you enjoyed it just a reminder that if you want to support my work be it podcasts or youtube videos please go to my patreon at patreon.com slash film where you can experience those episodes early among other perks and just a quick shout out to my patreon Tim Poppleton, So Fox, Inigo Almandos, Tim Tark, G Viral, Robert Murray, Henry Jacob, Manuel Jonan, Joshua Bowden, Anori Hayek, Jonah Gustafson, Tom Oliver Maddox. And remember, if you have any feedback about the show over social media, please use the hashtag FilmBrainPodcast.